tonight he didn't have to bless us but he did we're never good enough to have all that he gives to us but I thank him tonight because he loves us more than anybody in the whole world and he continues to reach out and touch our lives in spite of ourselves so I'm thankful tonight I'm so happy 
to hear the testimony about your daughter. I pray that she will continue to get better every day. That's such a miracle. Only God could do that. Amen. Only God could do it, yes. Thank you, God. Yes. Chapter, Father, we're so grateful for all that you've done for us. It's a privilege to be in your house. I thank you because you've never failed us. You loved us more than anybody in the whole world. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was made possible for us to be saved tonight. Thank you for all that you've done, for being so good and so kind. Thank you, God, for how you protect us day by day. Even when we don't know that where danger is, you're there. Thank you, God. From the depths of our heart, we say thank you. And may you be glorified in all that's said and done. We'll give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. The 5th to the 14th chapter of Judges puts it like this. Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. I want to preach to you a little while tonight. As I began to study this message, I thought this man has such a strong will and a strong desire to do things the way he wanted to do them. And he says to his mom and dad, I saw this woman, get her for me. I like what I saw. And then they tried to reason with him and said, well, what about so, uh, a wife among your own people? Why would you go to the Philistines? And he said, he wouldn't even answer them to that. He just said, get her for me. Now, when I looked at that, I thought, how many times have, have we as people have caused ourselves to be a victim because of our own will and our own way? Now, Samson knew the purpose for that, I mean, which he was, he was brought here for. And he was supposed to be a Nazarite from his mother's, from the time he was born. Never shave your hair, never drink wine. And so now, one thing I found out about him, you can refer to him as the strong, weak man. Because he was strong in one sense, but yet weak in another. And so when I looked at that, I began to think about the people of God and how so many times we get ourselves in a bad situation and we want to let, I mean, lay the claim on somebody that you made me a victim and actually after you made yourself one. So now we, if you look at Samson's life, he accomplished a lot. But by the same token, he lost a lot. And so when I look at that, I'm thinking, God, help your people to realize don't put yourself into a position where you are a victim rather than a victor. And you can do it very easily by what you say, by what you do. But if you really want to do right and have the victory every day, you can have it every day. You don't have to let the enemy come in and put these things in your heart and your mind and take you down the wrong path, and then you end up being defeated. Samson, in the end, uh, he repented before God for what he had done, but his death was kind of bittersweet because he had, he had done all these things, and it was all about women. I can say to you tonight, for the most part, if there's going to be an issue with a man, it's going to be about a woman. Some kind of way, it's always she's somehow tied up in that picture. And so now he goes down to get this woman and then 
he, the Philistines were constantly wanting to take this man out. They want to understand where his strength lies. And so they were constantly coming after him, even with this woman. And he had a riddle. And, and, and a, a, a something he had, he had done and after he had been in a, war, in a warfare, so to speak. And so they said to, his, to this woman, find out where his strength lies. Tell us where it's at so that we can come and break him. What the devil wants to do to every person is break them. He wants to take away your strength. He wants to take away your power. What are you going to do? You got to say, I'm not letting this go. So he tells, he tells uh, uh, this woman his riddle, and, and he had promised to give them uh, something in return if they could guess it. But she told them what it was. Oftentimes we share things with people, be it male or female, that should have never been spoken, should have never been told. As a result of that, somehow we're affected by it. And so she kept saying, kind of pulling him in, so to speak. And finally, he told, he told the real, but he didn't tell her what it was. Well, the Philistines kept on pressing her. And then she got to the point where she said, okay, what is it? What is it? And he told her what the riddle was. And then she passed it on to the Philistines. And, the, and, and when it came to Samson and asked, uh, and asked about the riddle, then she said, he said, had you not plowed with my heifer, you would not know. The fact that he, he, he referred to her as a heifer wasn't a good thing. I wouldn't think that was very nice for you to be called a heifer. <laughs> if you had not picked my heifer, you would not have gotten it. But now I'm going to do this. He went down. He kept his word. He done what he's supposed to do. But now, then when he comes back for this woman, he finds out her father has given her to somebody else. None of it worked out. Anytime you walk a path that is dangerous, you got to be very cautious that I don't get on a path that could cost me my life. And that's a very good possibility. So now he sees another woman. He don't get her. He's got a woman problem. And every time he picks one, he never picks a good one. He always picks one that ain't no good. You don't even want to hear anybody name their kid Delilah. Uh, 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 I mean, if they had a daughter named her Delilah. The very name sounds bad. And so now he sees this other woman, and the Bible says she was a harlot, meaning she was a whore in our language. And so he wanted her, and he went down and he got her. And, she, and he spent time with her, and, and the Philistines come again to try to find out where did the strength lie. Would you get with him and find out where it's at? And she did some of the same thing, the other woman, but even more extensive. And so now she says, Samson, you know how women talk to men, and they're so pitiful. <laughs> they're so pitiful. They get caught up for the moment. They look like a, a little sick puppy. What is it, baby? Women know how to play you. It's about time you wake up to realization you don't have to be played. You can be better than that. I say every once in a while I run across a strong man every once in a while, every now and then, every year or so, every three or four years. You run across somebody that seems like, for some reason, this is a pretty good fella. But when you find that weakness, I was reading about this man. I will leave him nameless because he's well known. And he is a billionaire. And what stood out to me that he accomplished everything that he wanted. But he married a playgirl from Playboy's mansion. And I thought, wow. And said people that heard about it were shocked because he didn't appear to be that type. This man had excelled. He was at the top of his game. He'd done everything that he could do, and he 
has money and money and more money, but he marries a whore. You can't get a wife out of a whore. You can't be something that you're not. Solomon says, if a woman, if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. But every woman does not make a wife. And that's what you got to consider. If you want a wife, you better be in the place where wives are. You don't go somewhere to a strip joint looking for a wife. Somebody that's sliding up and down the pole. No. Not by a long shot. You say, I'd like her, get her for me. Hey, how long will she last? Is that why people end up with divorces oftentimes? They end up with a divorce because they just like her. But most of the time, the like is about the outward appearance. What we really should get to do is get inside of a person, find out who they are inside, and not just about how you look. We get so caught up in the, in the outside, but we don't know who the person is. So... Samson, if you watch him, he continues to follow a path that causes him to become a victim. Now he's caught up in a situation, and they find out after Delilah says, tell me where thy great strength lieth. And he told her something else, and, and it didn't work. I don't have time to read all of it. And she, then he asked, she asked again, why are you lying to me? If you say you love me, if you love me, why lie to me, Samson? And then he starts breaking down. So then she comes back every time he told her where it was. When he, and then she knew, he, I mean, he knew she was setting him up. Because each time that she asked for your strength line, she said, Samson, the Philistines be upon you. Now you know she's trying to set you up. Why are you telling her this? It's something about that. The weakness that we find in people, in men, in women, is a bad thing. And so now she says, he tells her again, and then she's like the average woman, Samson. How can you say you love me? No doubt looked up in his face and how can you tell me that when you've lied to me these three times? And here's the weak man. Well, baby, I'm trying not to tell you my secret. Why didn't you say I'm not going to tell you nothing. You, this is the second time you said the Philistines be upon me, so you are trying to set me up. Should I get mad about that? I'm, I'm, I'm getting angry. You're playing me. Nothing is worse than to be played. Nothing's worse than that. And so now he says, and she's, she's probably shed a few tears now, Samson, Samson, come on, tell me where your great strength lies. And he finally says, if you cut my hair, should have never told her. Now, can you say it's the devil? I say it's Samson yielding to the flesh. Yielding to what the flesh want to do. And so, if you cut my hair off, I shall become as any other man. And here's what the scripture says. When she knew he had told her his heart, he called the Philistines. She called, he called the, uh, I mean, she called the Philistines. He's told me his heart now. Don't tell everybody your heart. That's where people destroy themselves. That's where you get hooked up in the wrong thing because you share your heart. Whoever you share your heart with, be sure you can trust them. Because that's where the greatest pain is. Show, actually let somebody look into your heart and see what you're all about is a dangerous thing unless they can be trusted. Because ain't nothing like a broken heart. And so now, uh, she says, this, I know he told me, so I can feel it. And then he comes up. And here's the Philistines. And he said, I'll go out as I did before. And I'll shake myself. And so to speak, I'll defend myself. Only to find out the power of God had now departed from him. He could not, he had nothing. He shook, but he didn't have nothing. 
You got a lot of church people like that. They're shaking, but they don't have nothing. And what, what you should have that is great and good, it's got to last. It's got to be solid. It's got to be strong. You cannot be weak today and strong tomorrow or back up and down like this. Bad position to be in. So where should we be? We should be in a solid place that we don't allow ourselves to become victims to Satan. And that's what he wants. He wants to break you. He wants to pull you down. He wants to destroy your life. He comes only for one thing, to steal, to kill, and destroy. You can't let him do that. If you really want to make it, you're going to have to hold your ground. And when you see the devil playing a game with you, by all means, don't give in to it. Say, oh, no, I'm not going down like that. But you know what happens when you get so far in and you've, and you've allowed yourself to become weaker and weaker? After a while, the devil takes full control because now you're presenting yourself that I'm weak and I'm in a, I'm in a position and I can't get out. Don't put yourself there. You got to be strong because we need to be victors. We need more people with testimonies of victory rather than defeat. Nothing is great about being defeated. I don't care who says, nobody wants to be defeated. But if you play games with the devil, I promise you that you will. See? So we have become victims because we have allowed ourselves to become victims. We don't have to be. Since Jesus came and said, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy and not by any means will anything hurt you because I've given you the power. So you don't have to give in. You don't have to become a victim. You can stay victorious. There is no greater feeling in the world than being victorious. You ever went on a long fast and, and, and made it through and had a difficult time and, and went through a lot of suffering? There's nothing like the day that you eat. That, you, that no, I'm not talking about just the food. I'm talking about the day that you eat that he didn't break you down during that fast. Because oftentimes, he comes with all these things to make you extremely feel bad and sick and weak and faint and all these things. But when you push through all of that and make it to the end, there is no greater feeling in the world than that. Because he's always there to attack you. He came to attack Jesus, but he didn't give in. And since he didn't give it, he said, if I overcome, now you can overcome. This goes for both of us. So I can have victory every day if I want it. Or else I can be defeated every day if I let it happen. And let me tell you, a defeated person is a person that's not going to be very happy. And their head's dropped all the time. And they don't even want to tell their story because they didn't win. You want to win. Victor, to be a victor is the greatest feeling in the world. So, listen, I think... We as Christians should have victories that we can testify about to the day we die. Because I defeated the enemy today, yesterday, the day before, whatever, I, I defeated him. I didn't let him take advantage of me. Victims are people who don't, who are very sad and broken. And you can get down very low from being a victim of anybody. Sometimes women, men are, are victims of their husbands or wives because of how they treat them. <laughs> and I often say, you tell people how to treat you. You don't take anything from anybody treating you bad, calling you names, putting you down. After a while, you start believing the garbage that he's telling you. You start believing that I, I'm no good. I'm going to have no self-worth. You know, I'm just in a, a hole in the wall. Don't let anybody do that to you. You know, words have great power. The scripture says, in the tongue there is life and death, right in words. We can either have somebody speak life to us or we can. And don't depend on somebody always speaking life to you. You speak it to you. That I'm a victorious person. That I'm winning no matter what I'm not giving in. You got to do it. It's important that you hold on to your strength, to your dignity, to your self-worth. Nobody's going to take that from me because I'm telling you, if you will yield to it, they'll take it. You got to say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm better than that. I can't tell you how many women I've talked to over the years. I say, and if they're going through a divorce or whatever, and they say, well, I don't know what I did wrong. I said, don't go there. Do not blame your 
yourself, if you were a good wife, a good mother, do not take responsibility for somebody else who wronged you. Make them bear it. Make them carry. Don't you give in to it. No, I'm not doing that. We have too much abuse in our society today constantly happening all across this country with people finding themselves in a victim position and they feel horrible about it. Some of them can't even stand up and look somebody else in the face and actually talk to them because somebody made me feel like I was worthless. No, don't do that. When I was a girl, it's the way black people, some black people uh, anyway, kind of deal with their kids and... I wasn't the person that believed anything they said I was. I don't believe that. They come here, you demon of the earth. I know I wasn't a demon of the earth. <laughs> you either going to believe that or you're going to say I, inside, I'm not a demon of the earth. I know that. I may not be doing everything right, but a demon, that I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to buy. You'll never amount to nothing. I'm not buying that. You know what, if you buy into that, you become a victim of somebody else's word, somebody else's power. I'm not going there with you. You're not, not for one minute going to make me believe that I'm not worth anything and I never will be. Don't buy. You're just like your daddy. He never mounted to nothing. You won't mount to nothing. I said, no. I may have a little of his DNA in here, but look, I got some things I can take charge of. I can be better than that. And you got to believe that. Nothing is worse than finding yourself in a, in a position. Well, you know, he always puts me down. Why don't you put him down here? Go, you're the fool. You're the crazy one. You're the nut. You're not going to make me take all these negative words. I give those words back to you. That's not me. Apparently, you don't even know who I am. Otherwise, you wouldn't call me that. But what do you know about yourself? That I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I'm not a person that's going to become a slave to anything. And the devil loves to enslave people and put them in positions where you can't even tell the devil he's a lie. And if you do it, you say, really, he's a liar. Oh, no, no. When you talk to the devil, you better get loud and you better get out of control. No, you're not doing this to me. You can whisper if you want to, and he'll stand there and talk you into everything. How many people made a mistake before? I mean, sincerely a mistake. And you come to church, you get ready to praise God. You're raising your hand for God ain't looking at you, and he's sick of you anyway. And every time you look up, you're making a mess of things, and you do this. Tell him he's a liar. I'm not taking it. I'm not going to take it. Women have been so weakened by our society. You know why? Because they dictate to us who, who we are, what we should look like, where we should be, and whether we're doing it just right or not. Women are judged in a negative way more than men ever been. To this day. They just, I mean, it's a put down. How can you do this? I was reading an article the other day in a book and they were talking about the different actresses that had lost all this amount of weight and they said Hollywood's uh, thing is uh, fat is never accepted in Hollywood just not accepted and so a lot of them have found themselves uh, starving themselves to death or or just becoming totally depressed sometimes suicidal because society says you shouldn't be that size you should be this size and you should look like this and if you don't meet the qualifications, then you're an outcast. Every once in a while, a fat one will, will fall through the cracks. <laughs> Oprah, 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 Oprah Winfrey was one of those people. She wasn't supposed to make it in Hollywood as such. And she still loves her food to this day. And most people do. But who says I have to be not here? Because you should be a zero. That's not present. What about me being present? See, why do I look at a person and down people for their exterior part and say this doesn't look right or this doesn't look right and why did you do that and why did you do this? You just have to turn it out. Not long ago was Oprah Winfrey interviewed some time ago by Barbara Walters and she said, what is the one thing that you wish if you had to do all over again that you could conquer? And she said, my way. And Barbara Walters said, are you still dealing with that? 
You lose it, you gain it. You lose it, you gain it. At some point, you got to say, forget it. You know, apparently, I'm not the one. Apparently, that's not working for me. Now, could it work for her? Of course it can. But if you're not going to do something where it is, is constant, just quit talking about it. Sometimes people won't pay attention unless you mention it. But this woman is, is over 20 million people watch on TV when she had the Oprah Winfrey show, and she was up and down like a yo-yo on a constant. We, lived, we saw the day when she drug out all the fat in a, in a red wagon. I said, so this, this is what I lost. And I thought, why you do that to yourself? That red wagon going to look less and less a problem. Because when you go to send them cookies and all that stuff, that red wagon, hey, ain't no big deal. And she said, see, I don't know how to eat a cookie. I eat the whole stack. Those were her words. She said, I don't know how to have a few potato chips. I eat the whole bag. Well, just forget it. Because you said, and you know what? It wouldn't be nothing worse than to die having accomplished all of this and was the queen of talk show and all these things. But you know what? She never could conquer food. She had her own chef who could fix you everything that's, that's very healthy. And you'd have a healthy diet. You didn't even have to cook for yourself. Every cook she ever had, she eventually got rid of them. And I know Art, the last one was Art. And Art went on and after becoming famous with Oprah Winfrey, he went on to open up a, 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 a Pima restaurant. And it's hardly a diet place. But I thought, what do you do when you get ready to farm? I'm not going to eat that food today. Why don't you just, hey, take a hike. I'm not going to do it. But you know what? If you live here, I don't know of nothing that you can accomplish in life, but there's one thing you never could get a hold on. And I died a life of defeat because I let one thing conquer me. And I only wish I had gotten rid of it. I only wish I had conquered it. And you cannot. Or you come to a place where you think, I don't want to. You know what? If you fail too many times, you start believing you cannot win. If you fall down a lot, you start thinking, I can't stand up. And it doesn't take long to get there to say, I don't think I can do it. He said, well, try one more time. I've tried and tried and tried. It doesn't work. We get, and then we let somebody come along and tell us that who we are and what we shouldn't be and what we, all these things, and we find ourselves in this fix and can't get out of it. A victim is a person that's usually adversely affected by a force or uh, an agent, somebody is pushing you. There are two things that's good in the world. One is bad things, and then the other thing is good things. And either good is going to influence your life or bad is going to influence it. So you got to say, what do I want in this process? Am I going to be a person that I gave in to every lousy thing that came in my life, or do I defeat it? Can I defeat it? Of course I can. But you got to believe it. So if you become a victim, it could be various things that happen to you in your life that make you become a victim. But Jesus came and said, I came to give you victory over all of this. So that now nothing, nothing by any means can yoke you up and put you in a vice where you can't get out because I've given you the power to do it. Nothing is worse than having power to do something and become something and never exercise it and remain in a place of defeat because we never took what we had that was power and used it for ourselves. And it happens all the time. See? Why would you subject yourself to... Being a victim, if you will. So, I saw this word as I was studying, and it's called victimology. I had not heard that phrase before. But it's the study of the ways in which 
the behavior of crime victims may have led to or contributed to their victimization. What did, what happened that led you to this? And so they go on to say the claim that the problem of a person or group or the result of victim uh, of victimization, I let this happen to me. So I think we don't spend enough time studying ourselves. We don't tell you what's wrong with everybody else. We don't tell you what's wrong with me. Study yourself. Who are you? What do you really possess? Are you the person that you say you are? Or are you the person that you would say that you'd like to be? You could be victorious. I, there is no feeling. Everything I've gone through in my life, somehow by the grace of God, I have determined I must conquer this. I must move forward in this. I must stand strong in this. Difficult times. Dark hours. How is the people that you preach to week by week going to view you in this situation? Every situation we face in our life as ministers, somebody's watching us and somebody's going to say, because you made it, I know I can. Somebody's going to do it. So you are responsible not to just preach this gospel, but to live this gospel. And if I tell you that God, grace is sufficient, when trouble come in my life, you need to see that. You need to be able to look at me and say, Sister Rose, look at her. She handled that in the way that it should be. I want to be like that. But if I let down, as a leader, really no leader should let down. Not if any people are following you as a leader. Not at all. So you got to understand everything we go through as leaders, we go through for, your, for you and for your benefit. Experience this so you can then tell people, no, you don't have to do that. Well, how are you going to deal with it? Let me tell you what happened to me. And then you say, wow, and you just got on up and done it anyway. Yes, in spite of. I did it anyway. Things didn't look good. Things looked like it was impossible. Things like it, would, it couldn't work. But I believed in my heart some kind of way it could work even though I couldn't see it. That's faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I believe it. When I don't see it, I still believe it. When it looks like there's no way it can work, I still believe it can. You'll be, able, you'll be surprised if people say, well, I know my, my auntie, my uncle, and I had cousins and everybody who try to, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for them. Why should I define myself by, by your uh, successes or failures? I'm not going to. I like being me. You're going to make this, girl. you got to talk out loud. You're going to get through this. You're going to be okay. And when it's done, you're going to feel good that you didn't crumble and fall apart, but that you still held on, that you still did what you had to do. I, I want people to know, look, that I can laugh about some of the most unbelievable things that have taken place in my life that I really probably shouldn't be laughing at, but I did. It's, you'll get more out of your situation with laughter than you ever will with depression. That's a fact. But you know, some people never laugh. Are you, I said, do you ever laugh? Yeah, well. Do you ever laugh? Just have a good, hearty laugh coming from the gut. Boy, this feels good. I look at these people and I go, <laughs> how do you have a good laugh? Even if it's bad, have a good laugh. And say, you know what? I just, sometimes we've had so many things happen in our family. It's amazing <laughs> how we get together at that house and laugh. Sometimes falling in the floor. Sometimes beating on the couch. You would say, those people are not normal. Yes, we are. You're not normal. Because what you do, you do just the opposite. And Walter said, oh, Mama, you know, it's amazing with all the things that's happened to us that we just find a place to laugh. Something's funny. There's always something funny. You're funny. <laughs> look in the mirror at yourself. You say, wow. Just look at you. And point out, wow, you're a funny person.
person. You look funny and laugh about it. We have the most fun, my kids and I, and we just talk about things and, and laugh. And I'm telling you, we have fun. And sometimes we're, we're acting silly the whole morning. They get there on Mondays to start uh, cleaning the house for me, and, and they'll come in at any time. I stopped that, though. I, put, I said, we're going to have a time y'all get here every, every, every morning. Because they come in, 10, 30, 10 o'clock, you know. And then they say, let's go upstairs and fix breakfast. You just got to work. You going for breakfast now? Wait for lunch. As late as you got here. So I finally told him, I said, come on, y'all, let's, let's get real. I said, let's set a time. On Monday is the hardest day because that's the day we're getting ready for church and we didn't like this outfit and we didn't like that and it's laying over there on some of the other clothes on the hook and shoes in the floor and all this stuff. So it's going to be much rougher on Monday. And then you've been in the, in the mirror with makeup and all that stuff. So it's going to take a little more on Monday. Tuesday is a breeze. 11 o'clock, everybody's done. But you know what? They got, now, they blame some of this on me. I don't take it. <laughs> they blame some of it on me. They said, every time we right in the middle of something, Mama said, come here, somebody. <laughs> and that's because I need you to get something for me. Now, check, check this out. If I gave birth to you and brought you in this world, been a good mother, by the time I start getting older, there's times I'm not going to feel like getting up. And I just need you to come here and take care of this for me. Okay, bring mama a glass of water. So they used to kind of make fun of that. And then Nisa's got a son, Kyle, is 24. And Kyle, he'll stay home with us sometime if I'm there on Wednesday nights because his mother needs a runner. <laughs> and she said, no, he's got to stay here because I can't move like I used to. So Kyle, go get this. Go get that. And you know what they used to say behind my back? If... I was in a room, and I'm sitting over here, and the TV's over here, and the remote control's there. I said, hey, hey, come here a minute. They come downstairs, and I said, uh, 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 give me that remote control. Here, 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 here's what they used to do. Are oh, you, you call me from upstairs? You get, yes, I don't feel like getting up right now. But now, as they get older, we're seeing this in them. I said, oh, now you got it. If I don't have to right now, could you, could you get that for me? Turn the air conditioner up a little higher. Do this. Hey, I deserve it. Yes. I know that. Juana, I know that, but you let the church know that. Yes. <laughs> So now what they did, they say we'd find something for mama to do on Monday. And uh, so I go, to the, I go to the massage therapist on this Monday, which is tomorrow. And they say, get mama ready. Get, and, and, I mean, they talk to me like I'm a kid. They said, let's get her ready. Because they really do have to help get me ready. And so I go, on, on Monday I go over to the massage therapist and and, and they'll say, now, we'll, do, we'll be done. Mama be gone. We'll get everything finished quick because she's not here to interrupt us at all. And I do. But you know what? I don't feel like that I am this, uh, what, what would you call it? This person that really cannot function, I can if I want to. But since I don't have to, yes. There is a difference. It's when I can't do it or I just don't feel like it right now. I should. And they are constantly on me saying, Mama, get, sit down. We'll take care of you. Mama, sit down. We're going to do that. You don't have to do anything. They really take good care of their mother. And I'm thankful for that. I really am. Now that I look back on all these kids I had, you know, they, they have some value. They're really of some value, and I'm, I appreciate it. But you know what? If they were not there, I personally would have to move and do more than I do. But when I, who, whoever knew that God was going to call me to the ministry, 
And I remember one time saying to the Lord, I don't think I should have been called to the ministry because there's so much I don't know. And you know what? When I went to the pulpit, I projected that. This was many, many, many years ago when we were way on South 8th Street. And I come out this little office that was right by the platform, and I would be sitting there thinking, I wish oh, God get somebody else instead of me. And I never forget this if I live to be 100. And he said to me these words, if you are going to have that attitude, that I should have took somebody else, you are never going to be effective in ministry because every time you get ready to minister, you think somebody else should be doing it. I dropped it from that day on. and say, God, if you call me, you'll show me what to do. You will direct my path. You'll help me to understand. And you know what? He did just that. So it's been many years. I don't have that feeling anymore. I'm not afraid of what I have to do. I'm not, a wor I'm not worried about failing. You'd be surprised at the people that constantly live their life. I, I feel like I'm going to fail. And they do. And they do. Listen to it. So if you look at your life today, what would you say about you? Who have you allowed? Paul said to the Galatians one time, who did you let bewitch you? Who did you consent to, to bewitch you, that you should not obey the truth. Why would you listen to them? Why didn't you take a different route? Why didn't you say, I'm not going down there, I'm not going to take that? Because what people can say to you and words, what words can do to you can defeat you all the way, all the way. You don't have to do that. You don't have to. But if you take that route, you'll live a defeated life instead of a life of victory. <clears throat> Listen, uh, Achan made himself a victim till he was killed and all his family because God had given them a command and he broke it. And as a result of breaking that command, he never thought about his family. He never thought about his children. They all paid the price for it. And he broke the law God said, take him out and stone him to death. And everything that pertains to him. You said, well, why would God do that? Don't worry about it. You can't call him in question. You can't say whether he's just or not. I say he's just. He's just in everything that he does. See? Understand. If you're going to have the victory, listen to the sound of the trumpet. Listen to it. The sound of victory. What is it going to blow? When they went around the walls of Jericho, the sounds of victory. When we blow the trumpet, start going around this wall. And when you do, all of this is going to fall down. Start getting with it. When you hear the trumpet of victory, that's saying we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. Don't ever say, I don't know, maybe I will. What will happen to me if I don't? Be a victor, not a, vic a victim. You can't afford to be that. You can't afford it. Think about it. I'm not going to live my life like that. There's no joy in being, a, being defeated. There's no joy in going down that road. What can I do? I can do the right thing. I don't have to do it wrong. See? You must not ever judge yourself by somebody else's failures or successes. You judge it by what God says to you in his word. Through him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everything, I can do it. Let us put into our vocabulary, I can, I can, I can. Can. Can't just one little difference in that word makes all the difference in whether you succeed or you fail. You get up this morning, I'm gonna make it. You feel no, I don't feel good, but I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna get through this. No matter how difficult it may seem. And seemingly that every time I go after I never get to that place I want to get, but I'm going to. Never give up. Never give up. It's important for you to win. And when you win, you help others to win. And as a leader, never, 
never should you fall down, ever. I take that very seriously in my life. Do not fall down in front of the people that you lead. That they may never say, well, if Sister Rose couldn't make it, I know I couldn't. You're never going to be able to say that. Some of these people have been with me forever. The Daisy problem the longest, 40 something years. Never. She can't say, well, a rose messed up that time. A rose fell down. I don't have to. To him that's able to keep me from falling, since he can keep me from falling, why do I fall? It's because I didn't take advantage of what was there for me. Can't do it. I guess the greatest place in my life where I had to be sure that I represented the kingdom well was when Charles died and everything I've told the people now, I've got to draw from that. The death of my husband was very quick with a brain aneurysm. So we were talking a minute, one, one minute, next few hours, he's dead. What do you do? I felt at first like I have a right as a human being to take time off and have that time to gather myself. Did I have it? No. And I called this evangelist, and I finally went to Ohio to meet with him after Charles' death, and I wanted to know from him, what did he do when his wife, Angel, died? And I used to watch him on TV all the time, and I had much confidence in his ministry. And he said, when you come, Ask my secretary to put you on the books and we'll talk. So I did. And I said, so did you take time off? He said, no. I wanted him to have time off. You know why? I would have said, if he needed time, I value this man. If he took time, I can take time. He said, no. So one of the ladies there that work in the office at the ministry said to me, uh, Brother Ainsley never took time off, and she said he preached one time and blood was coming through his nose, his ears, and his mouth. The grief was so unbelievable. He cleaned up and kept right on preaching. I thought, I don't stand a chance. I've got to do this job. Because then Charles died on, on um, Friday. Saturday, Friday, really had the aneurysm on Friday, had him unhooked on Saturday. So uh, Saturday, really the death. And I had to preach that Sunday. Not a member of this church could tell you I stood at this pulpit and couldn't preach. And sh nobody will tell you that. <laughs> Everything that happened to me during that period was seemingly was a reason that I could be I'm human. Yeah, you are. But God's grace is sufficient. And so he carried me through it. The greatest day, if there was a great day of my husband's death, was the day I preached his funeral. And I always told him, if you go before me, I'll preach your funeral. Nobody can tell our story like I can. So I did. And the funeral director said to me, are you going to be okay? I said, oh, I'm going to be fine. I knew that day. Of all days, I had to represent the kingdom well and not come in here falling apart and the whole church falling apart with me. They said, oh, this is wrong. oh my God. No, I, that, no, we couldn't do it. So when you look at a thing and I look back on it, I'm so happy I passed the test. Because when I leave this world, somebody, and before I leave, is going to have some issues as such. And say, well, what would Sister Rose do? This is what she did. And somebody is strengthened because why? I, w I was a victor rather than a victim. And I didn't give in to what I could have given in to. I could have just said, I can't make it to church. I'm not going to get through this. But oh, no, I got to pull it together. And I remember that, that morning, uh, uh, the day of Charles' funeral, I went to the living room and sat behind the desk. And I said to the Lord, I said, Whoa, I just want to represent you well today. That was my only concern, that I represent you well and that the people would know the gospel that I preach. I believed it and I lived it. And so help me today to do that. And I did it. So look at your life tonight and say, you know what? It's sweet 
joy to have to be victorious. It's happiness, it's excitement. Boy, I passed the test. I don't think nobody, whether you were in school or wherever you were, and you flunked the test, that you came out and said, hey, girl, I'm so happy I flunked. <laughs> I don't think so. We come out and say, I passed. I remember when I went to Germany and I went down to take my, take my driver's license, I was so positive I passed that test. I didn't care. What, I mean, everything in me said I passed that test. I got through it before everybody. And I went up to the desk with just the confidence of all, laid my test down there because, hey, I've just passed. I missed the thing by one thing. I said, you got to be kidding me. I know I passed that test. I was convinced. One answer? How did I do? I was so aggravated. I didn't come out there and say, hey, I missed it by one. Still, you still don't have no license? <laughs> but oh my God, the feeling of defeat. And my husband said, honey, don't be so upset. Just go back and take it. I know I can take it over, but I thought you I passed it. In Germany, you better pass that test. Or they're going to fry you on that highway. You better know how to drive in Germany. They don't have a speed limit. And when you get on the Autobahn in Germany and you're going on the Autobahn, when them Germans come up behind you flicking that light, lights on the car, that says, get over, because if you don't, I'm getting ready to take you out. You know you better move. And you know what? They rarely had accidents over there. Rarely had accidents. And I thought, I always told myself I'd never drive in Germany for that reason. Them, them Germans drive crazy. I mean, 125, 135 miles an hour is nothing. And I mean, they're coming, and everybody almost got a Mercedes, and every time you look up, there's some lights blinking behind you. And I say, get over, Charles, get over. Let's get out the way, because they're crazy. But one thing, one thing in your life can make you feel like you're a victim or defeated. You don't want to do it. Get up, brush yourself off, and go and push again. You can win. With Jesus, you can win everything. You don't never have to get to the place where, you know, I thought I could do it. I, I tried it, and it didn't work for me. Of course, it, it will work if you believe it. Whatever the word tells you, that's what you want to stick to. That's what you want to stand on. The story of Cain and Abel, and you know that story, uh, Cabel the scripture says, the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Why didn't God have respect for you? Because you didn't do it right. Your brother did it right, and I accepted it. You did it wrong, and I didn't accept it. Listen to this. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall his desire, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and he slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? For the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall be shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Listen to this. He kills his brother because he is jealous of him. Because God accepted his sacrifice and didn't accept his. And so he kills him. And when God punishes him for it, he had the nerve to say, wait a minute. My punishment is more than I can bear. You're not dead. If he would given you death, it would have been justice. But he says, I'm going to make you a vagabond.
find a trap in the earth. And he said, wow, I can't take it. You can take it, you kill somebody. Listen to this. We don't have to spend our life envious and jealous of nobody when the God that gave it to me will give it to you. So I don't have to sit around and feel bad and that I'll never get there because you got there because of this and you got there because of that. No, no, no. You get there because God helped you to get there and he exalted you in his own time. And if you want to be what God wants you to be, you can be and you can succeed. I think about Donna June, and I think you will succeed. All you have to do is follow the example. If you follow the example, what can keep you from it? God would not allow you to follow a good example that he exalted, and then when you follow it, you don't get it. No, you will get there. But don't give up. And don't mind saying, oh, I made a mistake. That's okay. But don't give up. You'll get there. So I'm not going to be one of those people who fall down and say, come help me, I can't get up. You got to get up. You got to do it. And make up in your mind, I can because he says so. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to be a victor. One who can go through it and look up and say, I made it. To me, when you start coming toward the end of your life, such as myself, one thing I think about, what did you leave behind you? Leave everything good. Not that people can say, well, you remember that time, don't you? No, I don't want that. I want to say no matter how tough, no matter how difficult, no matter how dark, no matter what was going on, she always pushed. And what happened? She won. You gotta believe that. I said the other day to my kids, I said, boy, wonder what would happen if I was gone with all this stuff going on. They said, honey, God wouldn't do that to us. <laughs> Are you kidding? A time like this? God ain't gonna do that. I said, no. I can't even imagine what it would be like. But there will come a day. One thing they will remember in time of crisis, in time of trouble, what did mama do? She prayed. She fasted. She continued the work that God called her to do in spite of it. She never got caught up in the trouble. She never got caught up in this or that. But rather realizing she had to come to this pulpit and give you the message that this week that will help you to say, I'm going to be victor this week. I'm not going to fail. And from this week, from this message on, if I've come short, if I fail, I'm not going to anymore. I take hold to that. If you can do it, you always, you always make up in your mind, well, what makes you so much better than me? If you can do it, I can too. I can make it. I used to sing that song, PTL, you can make it. This trial you're going through, it don't matter what's going on, you can make it. Say that to yourself. Don't say, well, I, know, I usually talk positive, but this time, I don't know. I'm usually a positive person. What happened? Where did the positive stuff go? What happened to it? I don't know. Maybe I, oh, my God, this is a bad one here. You know, you tell yourself all this stuff, you ain't going to make it. Just like you get on a fast and you got a long way to go. And tell yourself on the third day, oh, I'm not going to make it. And you got 20 days left? You better not tell you. One thing I learned about long fast very quickly, and that is you better not start thinking about where you are and how far you got to go. You just get on it and you just go. Don't even think about it. Don't spend time on it. And here's what happens a lot of times. If you feel bad, if you feel this bad, and it's just the fifth day, oh, my God, you hate to see tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's another day. You don't know what tomorrow, tomorrow may not even be a bad day. Fast is like that. Have a bad day and you have some good days. You may have a long string of bad days, a long string of good ones. You may have good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. But, hey, is that a reason to give up? No. Keep holding on. Keep pushing. Make up in your mind, I'm going to win this. 
I started out to win, not to fail. They got the Olympics going on now. Those people went there to, to win the gold, not the silver, not the bronze, but the gold. And if they went there saying, I, I'm going to win it, or else they could say, well, if I come back with a bronze, I'll be happy. You're not going to win the gold. You're not going to win it. So look at yourself tonight. Take a good look and say, am I a victor or am I a victim? What am I? Don't lie about it. If you're a victim, say, and who made me one? And where did I give up when I should have held on? That's a good thing. God bless you. I love you a whole bunch. Stand to your feet. I looked at P up here. I'm sorry, honey, I forgot to sit down. They put that behind me to take a seat, and I sometimes remember, sometimes I don't. And then I get home and say, boy, my legs hurt. You should have sat down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But make up in your mind, no matter what, I am from this night forward, I'm going to be a victor. I'm going to change. Everybody can change if they want to. And whatever you started out with, you don't have to stay there. It's a good life. But it's not fun when you fail. Fail, fail, fail. You will never be happy with that, I can tell you. There's no joy in it. So I want you to hang in there. When the fastest call for you this week, say, I can do it. Yes. And you know you can because we do it all the time. It's not a problem. See? So don't sit there talking. I wonder what is it. And Wanda comes out. <gasps> I ain't used to it. I don't understand it. What is it going to be? Wow. What kind of excuse can I give this week? I got to go to the doctor. That's why. Yeah. It's not going to work for you. <laughs> God bless you. I love you to pieces. Won't you raise your hands to Jesus. Father, we're so grateful tonight for your blessings, for all that you've done for us. What a privilege. What a privilege it is to be in your house. What a privilege to be called to minister the gospel. What a privilege, God, to be an example, to do what we need to do and do it right. I pray for your people. I pray for strength. I pray that you be with them, God. I pray, God, that you make them soul winners for thy kingdom. Do a work as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And P, you know what? I have to admire how well you stood up this weekend. You know what? This boy was really, really sick. He was in the bed all day Friday, right? Very sick. I get to church, he's sitting up here just saying, like he ain't never been sick. I thought, wow, that's what I call winning. Yeah, winning. <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And then he, he was so sick this morning. He still comes up and then he sings around the house when he knows he doesn't have a voice at home. The cold has just got him bad. And he was around the house singing. Love to sing. You know, when you love it, you'll find a way to do it. I love you. Hold up. I'll hug you when we get to the house tonight. Yeah, God is good. We appreciate you in the Lord. Want to be out here in just a minute, and she'll give you the good news about the fast. You don't want to miss that. God bless.